Boy, if you have a Bible, go ahead and open it. But open it to Hebrews. Okay, I know we're in Judges, okay? But go to Hebrews chapter 11. Last week, if you were here, I ended this, the, our time together last week with Hebrews 11. And this week, I want to start there because I probably should have done this at the very beginning of this series uh, through the gospel according to Judges. But as I thought more and more about it, Hebrews 11, as we think about these Judges, it becomes a very confusing chapter. Maybe one of the more confusing chapters in the Bible, right? If you think about it, because it's this list. It, it, the author of Hebrews, he creates this list of hall of faith inductees, right? Faithful, God-honoring men and women, right? By faith, Abel. By faith, Enoch. By faith, Noah. By faith, Abraham, right? By faith, Isaac. By faith, Jacob. By faith, Joseph, by faith, Moses. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. I mean, these are, these are the best of the best, right? In the Bible, these are the patriarchs. These are the heroes of the Old Testament. They're the heroes of the Bible. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> the author gets this other list. In Hebrews 11, verse 32, he says, what more, he writes, what more shall I say? I don't have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, right? I mean, these are, these are men, and if I put Rahab in there, we're not inviting these people over for dinner, right? I'm not inviting Rahab the prostitute to dinner. I'm just not. Gideon, who, who built an idol and drove the people away from God to idol worship, I'm not inviting Gideon to dinner. I'm not inviting Jephthah to dinner. But yet, they're listed here in Hebrews 11, verse 32, right alongside, if I keep reading, right alongside David and Samuel, and the prophets. So if, if I think of it that way, then again, Hebrews 11 becomes a little bit confusing as we see these individuals listed in the hall of faith, and it begs the question, how does God do what he does with whom he does it? Right? How does God do what he does with these types of people? How does God use a man like Samson, who we're going to look at this morning, for his purpose and for his glory to point us to Jesus, to point us to that salvation that he provides all of us, right? Hopefully we're going to answer this question over the next two weeks, because we're going to spend two weeks, like we did in Gideon, with Gideon, we're going to spend two weeks unpacking the story of Samson, a story that is arguably probably one of the more famous of the Old Testament stories. I don't know about you, I've been waiting for eight weeks to get to Samson. Right, I mean, he, he's so well known. And so what I want to do to kind of maybe prove my point as to how well we think we know Samson, we're going to do a little word association game. Okay, you ready? Going to get our minds thinking here? Yes? Ah, I just want to make sure we're alive there, okay? So here you're going to do, I'm going to, I want you to turn to your neighbor and say the first word that comes to your mind. When I say night, go. No, talk to your neighbor, not me. Okay. Day, yeah, I heard day. Anybody say dark? Anybody say sleep? Okay. What? Owls? Okay. All right. Here's the next word church. Turn to your neighbor. What comes to your mind when you think of church? Okay, let's go with this one hamburger, fries, <laughs> fries. I love it. cheese. In and out. Murder? Did I hear murder? Oh. Yuck. Yuck. Burgerville. Okay, whatever. Okay, so here we go. Now, now you, get, you get the gist of this now? Okay, you understand where we're going? So here we go. Okay. Turn to your neighbor. Not to me. To your neighbor. Samson. No, to your neighbor. Oh my gosh. Delilah. Okay. Okay, so I heard Delilah. Uh, did anybody say uh, strong? Long hair, okay, you got the long hair. Jawbone, okay, D -d did I miss any? Okay, did I, did I miss any there? Okay, anybody say anything else? Okay, yeah, we got Delilah. Mama's boy, there we go, there we go. <laughs> Woohoo, yeah, we're pulling that out, okay. Yeah, Samson, right, he's, he's one of those, he, he is, he's well known. In fact, next to Elijah calling down fire from heaven, Okay, Samson might be one of my favorite 
Sunday school stories, right? We think we know Samson well, well, right? Because our mind tends to go to one episode or maybe two episodes in Samson's life. So turn to Judges 16 in your Bibles or on your device, and let's, let's just start out with the end. Let's start out with that story that our minds tend to go to when we think of Samson, okay? The end of his life, Judges chapter 16, starting with verse 23. This is the death of Samson, right? This is, this, this is what we know or tend to, you know, gravitate to when we read Samson. Now the rulers of the Philistines assembled to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their God, and to celebrate, saying, our God has delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hands. And when the people saw him, they praised their God, saying, our God has delivered our enemy into our hands, the one who laid waste our land and multiplied our slain. And while they were in high spirits, they shouted, bring out Samson to entertain us. So they called Samson out of the prison, and he performed for them. And when they stood him among the pillars, Samson said to the servant who held his hand, put me where I can feel the pillars that support the temple, so that I may lean against them. Now the temple was crowded with men and women. All the rulers of the Philistines were there. And on the roof were about 3,000 men and women watching Samson perform. Verse 28. Then Samson prayed to the Lord, Sovereign Lord, remember me. Please, God, strengthen me just once more. And let me with one blow get revenge on the Philistines for my two eyes. Because they poked his eyes out. Verse 29. Then Samson reached toward the two central pillars on which the temple stood, embracing himself against them, his right hand on one side and his left hand on the other. Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And then he pushed with all his might and down came the temple on the rulers and all the people in it. Thus he killed many more when he died than when he lived. Right, I think I, I, think I, I found a picture. I think we can throw it up there on the screen. Right, when you just type in Samson, this is what comes up. Nine times out of ten, this is the picture you get. It's Samson between two pillars pushing them over. Right? That, that's what we think of when we think of Samson. So let's go ahead and close in prayer and go home. No, there's, there's so much more to Samson. That's why we're going to spend two weeks on his life because there's so much we can learn from his story. So we'll go, let's, let's pray before we dive into the story of Samson and his role as a judge. God, as I think about Hebrews 11, Lord, there's so many men and women that you used despite their weaknesses, despite their failures. God, you use them to pursue Man, God, in your story of redemption, we have this long line of men and women that both served you but also failed you, God, on occasion. But yet, you redeemed, you restored, and now they're found in the hall of faith, God. May that be true for us as well. God, that even in spite of our weaknesses, Lord, you use us and we remain faithful to you in the ups and downs on this roller coaster that we find ourselves on in this journey to become more and more like your son, Jesus. God, just show us this morning, God, through your word, may we learn a little bit more about not just ourselves, but about you and your heart and your love and your grace. And may we walk out of here worshiping you. We love you, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So now go back to... Judges 13, Judges chapter, chapter 13, this is where the story of Samson begins. It comes near the end of the book of Judges. In fact, Samson is the last judge that's specifically talked about. And other than, like I said, other than Gideon, we, you know, he, we probably know more about Samson than any other judge. He's given four chapters, four chapters there at the end of Judges. Unlike Shamgar, okay, who in Judges 3 is, is relegated to one verse. One verse, after Ehud came Shamgar, son of Anath, 
who struck down 600 Philistines with an ox goad, and he too saved Israel. That's it. That's all we know about this guy named Shamgar. He killed 600 Philistines with an ox goad, and he saved Israel. But Samson, we have four whole chapters dedicated to this one man. Why? Well, I think as we go through these next two weeks, you're going to see the message of Judges become clear as God gives us a picture of how he saves his people. So let's begin reading here, Judges 13, verse 1. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. Right, there's that phrase that we've read over and over and over again, right? Week after week after week. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Now, this is the last time that we're going to read this phrase here in Judges. It's not the last time they will do what's evil in the eyes of the Lord, but it's the last time this phrase is used in the, in the chapters following Samson. Uh, it's alluded to as it talks about they did what was right in their own eyes, but not this specific phrase. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And so once again, the Lord's going to raise up a judge. He's delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years, and like every other time, he's going to raise up a judge. But this time, he's going to do things a little bit differently. He's going to do things a little bit differently. Go to verse 2. Let's keep reading. So a certain man named Zora, uh, I'm sorry, a certain man of Zora named Manoah from the clan of the Nights had a wife who was childless, unable to give birth. And the angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, you are barren and childless, but you're going to become pregnant and give birth to a son. Verse 4, now see to it that you drink no wine or other fermented drink and that you do not eat anything unclean. You will become pregnant and have a son whose head is to never be touched by a razor because the boy is to be a Nazarite dedicated to God from the womb. And he will take the lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines. I want to stop there because there's some important truths, there's important lessons, there's some observations just in these first few verses that I want to make that help, again, point us to our own salvation through Jesus. First of all, let's go here. What, what's missing as we just, as we dive into this story, just we're right at the, right at the, the footsteps of Samson, this doorstep. What's missing from this cycle? Let's go ahead and put up the, the cycle that we've been going through throughout this series. Okay, uh, that Israel finds itself caught in, right? Disobedience, which we know they're doing, right? Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, so we tick that one off. Discipline, okay, he'd given them over the Philistines for 40 years, and then we've got desperation, deliverance. What's missing in that cycle? Yeah, desperation, right? There, nowhere, as, he's, as the angel appeared to uh, Samson's mother, and he's preparing to raise up a judge, there's no repentance there that we see. The cycle all of a sudden has been broken, right? Which I, what I think is important for us to understand. There's no desperate cry for help. And yet, even without repentance, God is going to raise up a judge anyway. This time, God's not going to wait for Israel to pursue him or to seek after God. He's going to instead pursue them on his own. He's going to seek them out. He's going to deliver them. And the same is, is true for us today. It's kind of a foreshadowing of what Paul wrote in Romans 5.8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While Israel was still sinning, God reached out and raised up a judge. While we are living in sin or we're living in sin, depending on where you are, God still sent Christ in his love to die for you. This is an important thing to draw out of the story of Samson. That God pursued them even in their sin. A second observation. This is the first time that a judge is promised before the judge is even born. Right? Every other time God raises up someone who's already alive. Right? A mighty warrior. Right? Who, you know, Gideon, Jephthah. God raises up somebody. He makes them strong. He gives them strength. He blesses them. This time God's going to start from scratch. It's going to start from scratch with the birth of Samson, which has some things in common with the birth of Jesus, right? From the visit by the angel to Samson's mom, 
to some, some obscurity here that Samson's being born into because we don't even know the name of Samson's mom, right? That's, it's just a wife of Manoah, right? It's, it, he, in verse 6, then the woman went to her husband, right? We don't even know her name. There's some obscurity there. We also see in verse 5 that Samson, like Jesus, is going to be set apart as a Nazarite, right? Which, which, okay, what does that mean? Well, this Nazarite vow that this angel's referring to that he, he lists some stipulations on, you can go back and read it in Numbers chapter 6, verses 1 through 21. We won't take the time to do that, but let's just recap these three stipulations that are on not just Samson's mom, but Samson, right? First of all, he's not to cut his hair, stipulation number one. Number two, he's not to drink anything from the vine, right? No fermented drink. And then he's not to touch any dead bodies. Now, usually this vow was made voluntarily, right? For a definite period of time. Usually while the individual was asking God uh, for something special during this crucial time. And so this is how they would really have this, you know, make sure that they had this intense focus on God. They took this vow that they would not do these things as they called on God to rescue them or to provide them with something. That was the purpose behind this vow and it was for a particular period of time and it was taken voluntarily but here this vow is already placed on Samson before he's even born he is set apart for God's work now what what is that what what exactly is God calling Samson to do we'll go to the end of verse five the end of verse five says he that Samson he will take the lead in delivering Israel from the hands of of the Philistines. He, Samson, will take the lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines. Several other versions, depending on what version you have, the NASB, uh, New Living Translation, ESV, says he will begin to deliver Israel from the hands of the Philistines. He will begin to. He will take the lead in. I think that's important language for, not, for us not just to fly by because that tells us Samson is actually going to leave the job incomplete. The other judges that we've looked at, if you remember, they delivered Israel. And there was peace in the land for 8, 60, 12 years. Here, Samson's not going to complete the job. He's beginning to. He's taking the lead in. He's leaving the task undone, which begs the question, <laughs> well, how does the story end? Right? Where's the conclusion to this story of God's deliverance? Well, if you're asking that question, then you're reading the Bible the right way. Because deliverance comes in the form of Jesus. It happens in the New Testament. This is how Samson, the story of Samson, points us to Jesus. Samson begins. He plays a role in. But because he is not a perfect judge... Because he has weakness, he's failures, he's not perfect. He cannot complete the task. That can only be completed by, by our Savior, Jesus. By the coming of the Messiah. And that really is the gospel according to Judges. That, that this, this promised Messiah that Samson is giving us a, a small glimpse into. Now drop down to verse 24 there of Chapter 13, the woman, again, his mother, who we don't have a name for, the woman gave birth to a boy and named him Samson, and he grew, and the Lord blessed him, right? Now, if I stop here in, in this first chapter of the four chapters of, Sam, of uh, Samson's life, things, things are looking pretty good, right? God's chosen Samson's mom to give birth to this this man that's going to help deliver, going to begin to deliver Israel, right? He's got this Nazarite vow on him. He's been set apart from God. He's been set apart by God to do some amazing stuff. And here in verse 24, the Lord is blessing him, right? This sounds, like a, sounds like a story with a happy ending, doesn't it? It all sounds good. But as we will soon find out, which most of this will take place next week, Right, so you have to come back. 
But as we're going to see, Samson is quickly going to claim a life of compromise, impulse, entitlement, and pride. It's all going to begin to unravel, and it's all going to begin to unravel, unravel rather quickly. Go to verse 1, chapter 14. Let's just look at how his life just begins to immediately unravel. Remember, he's just been, he's just been blessed. He grew up, and the Lord blessed him. And then verse 1 of chapter 14, Samson went down to Timnah, and he saw there a young Philistine woman. And when he returned, he said to his father and mother, I have seen a Philistine woman in Timnah. Now get her for me. Get her for me as my wife. Now his father and mother replied, Isn't there an acceptable woman among your relatives or among all our people? Must you go to the uncircumcised Philistines to get a wife? But Samson said to his father, <laughs> simply repeating the phrase, Get her for me. Right? Get her for me. She's the right one for me. Now this cracks me up. Okay? Think about the impulsiveness of Samson. He goes down to Timnah. He's cruising down the road. He sees a woman. Doesn't talk to her. Doesn't ask her name. What fam family background. He just sees her and impulsively says, what? She's the right one for me. Get her. Imagine if you did that, guys. Right, man, I'm walking down the road. Rose cruises by. Yeah, she's the right one for me. Go home, Dad. <laughs> go get her. Okay, just go get her, boom. I mean, hey, uh, you know how that's, that'd go over. But this is the impulsiveness of Samson. And we're going to see throughout his life, they, this is, it, it, his impulsiveness is controlling. It controls me. It's controlled by his passions and his reaction to how he feels about what he sees. And it's going to lead to a specific weakness that's going to be his downfall. So he's impulsive. The second thing we learn about Samson in just these short verses, is not only is he impulsive, he's unteachable. He's unteachable. Go back to verse 2. His father and mother replied, Isn't there an acceptable woman among your relatives? Or all other people? Must you go to the uncircumcised Philistines to get a wife? And what does Samson do? Get her for me. Right? He completely dismisses the parental counsel. He completely dismisses the authority of his father, which is unheard of in ancient Israel. One commentator I read, Arthur Condell, he wrote a commentary on Judges. He writes this, in Israelite society, the father was the head of the family and as such exercised control. And you might as well put the word complete control in there. It wasn't just, you know, every now and then I get control, right? Kind of like my house. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. We're talking complete, complete control, including the choice of wives for their sons. So this was not Samson's choice. This was the choice of his father. And yet Samson just disregards Israel history and how things are supposed to work. He's, again, he's impulsive and he's unteachable. And what's interesting about this is this is not just a summary of Samson's life. But if we think about what we've been learning about the nation of Israel throughout this entire series, this is a summary of their life. Right? The nation of Israel, they're impulsive. Right? They're just, they're, they're just tossed to and fro by the wind of whatever God looks good to them in that moment. What do I need? It might be a false God. It might even be the true God. But they're just whatever in the moment. They're driven by their impulse in who they worship and who they cry out to. And then they're also unteachable. They're unteachable. They just, again, because of, we've seen it throughout this cycle, right? And judges, they just don't get it. Again, they did what was evil in the eyes of the Lord. So the weaknesses of Samson, he's impulsive, he's unteachable. We're going to also learn that he's vindictive, and he's got a pretty bad temper. Got a pretty bad temper. But God's going to use all this. And this is what I started with in Hebrews, when I was talking about Hebrews 11, right? It, it, it begs the question, how does God do what he does with whom he chooses to do it with? 
How does God take a Samson, someone who's impulsive, unteachable, vindictive, has a bad temper, how does God use that person to fulfill his purpose? And his purpose in in the story of Samson, as we're going to see, is to bring confrontation between Israel and the Philistines. God wants to bring confrontation. He needs to create a division between Israel and the Philistines. Why does he need to do that? Well, here's why. Because as the occupation of Israel continued by the Philistines, as it lingered, the captivity actually became peaceful for Israel. That's why there was no cry of desperation, because they didn't feel in despair. They all of a sudden became very comfortable hanging out with the Philistines. Enough so that Samson even thought, hey, I'll just marry one of them. That's how comfortable it was to be enslaved by the Philistines. They didn't even feel like it. They hadn't cried out to God again because it was comfortable. Rather than push back, they have completely adopted and adapted to the values and idols of the Philistines. They were eager to marry into that society, to marry into that culture. And I I, I honestly don't believe it's an exaggeration when I say it. at this point in Israel's history, I believe they were in danger of becoming extinct. Right? They were so embedded. I mean, think about all the times they'd cried out to God before this. And now all of a sudden, huh, we're good. Right? We're Philistines. Right? We're, we're a combination of the Israelites and, and the Philistines. So then God steps in and raises up Samson, who's And God's going to use his impulsiveness, his impulsive weakness to help deliver or to to begin to bring Israel to its senses so they don't completely assimilate into the Philistine nation. And again, as we go through this next week, we'll dive a little bit deeper into that. But here's what I want us to draw out of this this morning. Because there's a valuable lesson here. I think sometimes we read, you know, the intro to someone's story and we think, oh, okay, well, let's get to the good stuff. Let's get to Delilah, right? As, as I shared, no one, no one brought up the first three verses or first five verses of Samson's life. No one said, oh, late, you know, woman in Timnah. First thing that comes to my mind when I take Samson, right? Nazarite vow, set apart from God, vindictive temper. No, it was Delilah, long hair, strong. That's what we brought up. But again, there's a, there's a, a challenge for us here in the way this story is unfolding. Because if we, when I say we, I mean the church and more specifically Calvary Parkside, if we're not careful, we run the risk of becoming like Samson and becoming like the nation of Israel. Of becoming comfortable with the culture around us. Becoming so comfortable, in fact, that that we begin to figure out, okay, how can we, how can we be, you know, how can we reach out to the, uh, you know, I, I grew up in the, the seeker-sensitive movement, right, of the 90s, right, where churches all of a sudden, we need to be relevant, right, we need to be relevant. Well, what does relevant even mean, right? They were trying to figure out, churches were trying to figure out how to become relevant. How can we adopt some of the worldly culture and make it churchy, right, so that we can, and we became comfortable we became comfortable with that. We run the risk of, of doing things like that. We run the risk of placing tolerance and inclusion above the infallible revelation of God's word. We risk being a church that dismisses things like church discipline. Jesus is the only way to salvation. Okay, personal accountability. Personal accountability. Right? We don't talk about sin. We don't talk about judgment, heaven, hell, right? Those are things that we, we don't talk about because they're not culturally friendly. That's what Israel did. Israel and Samson, they both decided it wasn't culturally friendly to worship the one true God only. So we're going we're gonna to mesh this all together. And so God needed to raise up Samson to create some division to create separation between his chosen people and the culture 
around them. And so I, my prayer, and I and my hope your prayer, is that we, Calvary Parkside, would maintain those core beliefs. Right? I just want to remind you of these core beliefs. Right? If you're new, if you've only been here for six months or a year, okay, these may be new to you, but this is what we stand on. This is what we protect. This is what we hold dear here. Things like the absolute authority and truth of the Bible. Right? That it is without error. That there's only one living, true, and eternal triune God who reveals himself to us as God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And that because of his love and grace, he sent his only son Jesus to come down to earth, to die in our place on the cross, to pave the way for people to be restored to a right relationship with God. And that Jesus was resurrected as proof of God's ultimate plan. That Jesus will return as king. And finally, that there is a heaven and there is a hell for all eternity. That's the gospel according to judges. That's the gospel according to the Bible. And that's what we, as your pastors, seek to protect we want to protect these doctrinal beliefs that a culture would love to get in and mess with. Right? And cause us to question whether or not it's really right. Is it really true? Is it really something we should hold dear? Again, next week, I want to invite you to come back as we continue the story where we'll begin to recognize Jesus as our true judge who will succeed in every place that Samson fails. We're going to look at the failures of Samson, and in those we're going to see how Jesus succeeded where Samson fell short and how that points to Jesus as our true and perfect judge, the only one that can rescue us from our sin. As we close, I want to close a little bit differently this morning. As I've been thinking about who we are as a church, what our core values are, what we talk about up here almost every Sunday, right, that we are up here to worship God passionately, connect with one another authentically, grow to know one another, grow to know God more deeply, right, go and tell the the gospel boldly, making Jesus' name non-ignorable. I want to share with you Also, why we do things like this, why we spend time, why we take 30 minutes, 35 minutes diving in to God's word. Because I think sometimes we get, we we get lost in, we get lost in, and we don't understand what is the true motive of this. Because it's not about information. The goal of a sermon is not just to learn a, a bunch of information about Samson. And Delilah. Right? Noah and the ark. David and Goliath. Paul and Silas. Right? Peter. It's not just to learn a bunch of information. And if I'm honest with myself, it's also not about action steps. Sometimes, I mean, I I do this and I know other pastors do this. We sweat over the application. All right, man, I've got to come up with an application point. There's got to be some action steps to God's word. I want to make sure it's applicable to your lives. I get that. But that's also not the ultimate goal of a sermon. My goal, and I'll speak for myself. I don't want to speak for James and Larry. But my goal is to leave you worshiping. My goal is to leave you worshiping. My hope is that as you're sitting at your in your chair and if you've got a pen and pencil and you're right you're taking down notes you're right you're scribbling frivolously you're taking notes on your phone that at some point that pen goes down and your eyes go up your pen goes down and your eyes go up as you turn your focus away from all these things i gotta do for god man i gotta do better i gotta lo- i gotta love my family more i gotta read the bible more i gotta pray more man i gotta share the love of jesus more i gotta go great commission right that we would take our eyes off of all these things I got to do for God 
and realize what God has already done for us. That's the takeaway from every message we preach. Every message that is preached from this stage, I want it to be that. Not what we need to do for God, but what God has already done for us. And that's what I want us to take away from the gospel according to Judges, the story of Samson, and whatever we do next in our next sermon series. Let's do that. So I want my, my prayer is that we leave here worshiping. And we're going to do that right now with a closing song, another way we worship, because this is what this morning's all about. We worship God through music. We worship God through prayer, through giving kids Bibles, through opening His Word, and again through singing. So bow your heads and let's pray as we close this morning. God, we love you so much. Lord, and my desire is that I would focus more on you, less on me, more on what you've already done, less on what I need to do. God, that we would worship you passionately. And that passion would drive us to become more and more like Jesus and to share the message of hope, to share the message of of redemption, restoration, a God who is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. God, this morning as we close, may this be a time where we do, we lift up our voices in praise and glory and honor to you. We love you and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.